like to welcome everybody to the Metropolitan Church of Christ. We are hoping that you are in a wonderful state of mind on this morning. We know that these circumstances are not circumstances that any of us would have chosen for ourselves. But God has, in his providence, prepared ways that even when we are going through great trial, the God of heaven has fixed it so that the people of God are taken care of. We just wanted to let you know that it is always a mighty good time to give the Lord praise. We don't just praise the Lord when things go well, but we praise him even in the midst of struggles yes. because he is worthy of praise. He's not just worthy because of what he has done, but he's worthy because of what we know he shall do. And so we bless his holy name and give him glory and honor and praise the Lord today. We're hoping that you are honoring him wherever you are, whether you are part of our skeleton crew here at the church, whether you are sitting in your living room uh, in front of a television set, whether you are sitting in a car, uh, perusing Facebook, or even if you are still in bed, and whatever you're doing, we want you to just give God praise. We're going to open it with a word of prayer. So if you can, wherever you are, just bow your heads. Almighty Father, the great God and King. Father, we come to you because you are trustworthy. Father, you are not just a God who is requiring things of, things of people, but you are a God who loved people enough that you came down to meet them where they were. Dear God, we thank you for your trustworthiness. And so we know even at this time, in this hour, you shall do what needs to be done. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The first song we're going to sing today is a, is a song, it's an old song. It's a song which says, when the storms of life are raging, stand by me. <clears throat> when the storms of life are raging, Stand by me. When the storms of life are raging, stand by me. Oh. 
When I grow, when old and feeble, stand by me.
Good morning, church. Good morning. We come to the part of the service for the community. Amen. This is the part, brothers and sisters, that we just want to always remember what Jesus did for each and every one of us, giving us that chance at everlasting life. And I just want to uh, read and want us to meditate on uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting at verse number 23. It says, For I have received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, Many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. Brothers and sisters, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we humbly come to you once again, Lord, and we always thank you, Lord, for the many blessings you bestowed upon us, Lord. And we just uh, ask you right now, Lord, if you bless the bread and the cup that we see, we know what it represents, Lord, and we just pray, Lord, that we will never forget the ultimate sacrifice that we will always remember. Jesus done for us, Lord, and we just pray, Lord, that we would just be able to walk in the manner that you want us to walk, Lord. We thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may break the first and the second too.
Good morning, church again. Morning. Let us turn our Bibles to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 6. And I will read it to your hearing verses 4 through 8. Hebrews 6, verses 4 through 8. The Bible says, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. If they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh off upon it and bringeth forth herbs meet for meet for them by whom it is dressed receiveth blessings from God. Verse 8. But that which bear thorns and briars is rejected, and it is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. May the Lord have a blessing to the readers and doers of his word. Let us pray at this time. To the most high and most righteous Father, we thank you. We thank you for allowing us this day, this day to honor you and to celebrate you and to worship you in spirit and truth. Lord, we just are so grateful that you continue to, to give us peace. You continue to give us comfort in the midst of the storm. We ask for your continued grace and your continued mercy. Lord, as we continue to worship you this day, we ask for your presence, for your continued presence over our lives. We ask right now, Lord, that your word will be delivered by your answer, that it will be delivered in its simplicity, and that we may be able to take this word in and just apply it to our lives. Continue to guide us and protect us. In Jesus' name we pray. Soldier, pray. 
are continuing our journey in the, the book of Hebrews. We're in the sixth chapter. We will be reading verses 4 through 8. And so if you have your personal copy of the Word of God, whether it is an actual copy of the Word, meaning the book of the Bible, or whether it is in your Bible app or some other virtual manifestation of the Word of God, we would like you to read along with us. We have been talking about hope. And if there was ever a time when we needed hope, that time is now. And in the book of Hebrews, we are trying to get to chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. But the Bible says this hope we have as an anchor of a soul. We want to talk about the hope we have. But before we can get to verses 19 and 20, we have to journey through uh, this chapter, this sixth chapter, so we can understand the proper context of hope. Hope is an anxious expectation that something good is going to happen. And we believe in and we are hopeful even today. We are not wishing things will get better. We are not wishing that God is going to deliver. We are sure in our hope. We have an expectation that something good is going to happen. It's like working on a job. When you check in on your job, you hope to get paid. But your hope isn't thinking you might not get paid. <laughs> no, no, no. You are looking with anxious anticipation that on Friday or on the 1st and 15th or whenever you get your check, that you're going to get paid um, for what you have been doing. We have a hope in God. It is based not so much on our conduct as it is based on the character of God. The hope for the child of God is rooted in the God who never breaks a promise. And so God has told us, as long as I say it, it shall come to pass. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul tells us that God cannot deny himself. So even if we are unfaithful, the Bible says he remains faithful. God does not base his character on the conduct of his creature, but it is based in the immutability of his character and the impossibility for him to lie. So, we come here to our text in Hebrews 6, verses 4 through 8. The Bible reads, For it is impossible for those who are once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come if they shall fall away to renew them again to repentance seeing they re-crucify the Son of God and put him to an open shame or openly shame him. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh off upon it and bringeth forth herbs fitting for them by whom it is dressed receiveth blessings from God but that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing whose end it is to be be burned. Uh, we come now to one of the most difficult passages of scripture in all of the Bible. One of the most debated passages 
in the entirety of Scripture. And many come to this passage and because they have predispositions hermeneutically, meaning their interpretation or their seeking of meaning for this passage begins with what they have already decided what can and cannot be. It becomes a quagmire. It becomes circuitous. It becomes a situation in which finding meaning becomes extremely difficult in this passage. <laughs> well, the problem is, if we were honest, biblically honest, all of us have predispositions. All of us have thoughts on what we think things are. All of us have predispositions toward meanings of things. Even when it comes to scripture, by way of illustration, have you ever, if you're a parent, have you ever had a child come to you and you know they had done something wrong? And when they come to you, they are telling you, no, I didn't do it. And you are telling them, no, no, I know you did because I know you. I know you did it because I know you. Well, has it ever happened that you find out later that they really didn't do it? It was just your predisposition about them that made you interpret their action in a certain way. Well, that happens all the time. It happens in relationships between husbands and wives. It happens on the job. It, you, you, you've been late five times this year, and then on the sixth time, you tell your boss, no, no, for real, my grandmother died last night, and your boss said, yes, yeah, sure. Because he is judging you based on the other times he saw it. That's predisposition. Well, when we come to passages like this, many of us need to understand we have predispositions. Uh, we have opinions we have already formed about the subject matter. I want to give you an old medical term as we go to this passage. The old medical term goes like this. When you hear hoofbeats in the hallway, think horses, not zebras. What that simply means is, the simplest answer is usually the right answer. When you hear the hoofbeats, if you're in America, it's more than likely not zebras. But sometimes we come to these passages and we start to think zebras and not horses. The problem is there are four, y'all stay with me? I hope so. There are four different ways uh, don't let me start lying. There's like 10 different ways. Uh, don't let me start lying. There's, like, there's a whole lot of different ways <laughs> that people have interpreted this passage. I want to give you a few just, just very quickly. There's one called the Armenian view. The Armenian view uh, is a view of salvation in that it is possible for a person to be saved and then consequently lose that salvation. And then there is the Calvinistic view. Uh, there are several permutations of the Calvinistic view, but there's a Calvinistic view in which a person, once they are saved, they are always saved. And then there's a view that people uh, uh, aren't really once saved, always saved. What it is is that folks who fall away never were saved. All of those come into view here. I am not here to try to pretend I can unravel every argument about this passage. Nor am I here, no, nor do I have enough hubris to believe uh, that that me, uh, uh, myself, is able to, to, to come definitively to a, a conclusion that for the last 1,500 years, doctors and scholars have been debating. What I want to do here is just look at this passage as I can uh, linguistically uh, and ex exegetically draw some conclusions but stay with the point of what he's talking about. Now remember, we were saying that in order to have hope, you got to grow up. you got to have maturity. Because hope for the next situation 
comes from having endured something. That's how hope builds. And so when you are in one step, when you go to the next step, you realize that you are able to do some stuff you didn't think you were able to do. But as long as you say step one, the stuff that is at step two seems impossible. For example, uh, I am, <laughs> I used to be an athlete, but I've never been a good basketball player, ever, never. <laughs> I like to play. I'm one of those guys who like to play. <laughs> Not one of those guys who is a player, <laughs> if you can understand the difference. And so, it amazes me to see people hit three pointers. That's amazing to me. It's amazing to me how confident they are shooting the ball from way over there when I have a problem shooting a five foot. It's amazing to me. Well, of course, I've never put it in my time. I've never shot the whole thousands of balls. I, I, was, I was an athlete, so I just run out and dunk the ball. That was fun. So if it was open, throw me the ball. I can run and dunk it. That was fun. But folks who can really play, it is amazing to me. And I was saying, wow, I could never do that. That's because I'm only at step one. See, people at step two, that's nothing. That ain't no big deal. Three, if I'm open, it's down. That's how they feel. Now, when you get to the professional level, those guys are at such a level, if they feel if you don't play the exactly right this time, you can stick me all you want. But even if you stick me, you I'm going to make this. So, so that's different levels. That's how hope is built. When you stay at level one, stuff at level two, three, and four seems like forever. And so what, what the Hebrew writer here is in telling his sermon, he says, listen, I want to tell you about level five, about Melchizedek. Because that's the level you need to be at to understand that your situation is not so bad that you can't make it. The problem is, he said, I got to pivot. I wanted to talk to you about Melchizedek and the hope you can have in Melchizedek, but you're not grown up enough. To, so I need to talk to you about growing up before we can get back there. Because I need to tell you some grown folks stuff. And so then he was, he was telling us as we looked on last week, he says, therefore, let us leave his the, let us leave elementary stuff. Let us leave the, the doctrine of our Christ and repentance from dead works. Let us leave the doctrine of baptism and, and of laying on of hands. Let, let us leave of the, the, the re resurrection from the dead and eternal judgment. That's level one stuff. And if that stuff seems, still seems big for you, you're not ready to go through what God is about to take you through. See, God wants to get you to the point where you don't have no kids at that level. And you're still on, on, on milk. He says, no, I need to get you off this milk, off this cellar, and get you on to strong meat. I need to take you to another level. So understand that when we, as we approach our text. He says in verse number six, hope y'all still, verse number four. He says four. See this introductory clause. For it is impossible. He says, let us move on. He says, now let us move on uh, from this stuff. Because the stuff you're going to need to get over is stuff that accompanies salvation. And if you leave your salvation behind, there's no way you're going to make it. He says, for, I'm telling you, for it is impossible for those that he gives us five different areas. For those first, who were once enlightened. Next, those who have tasted of the heavenly gift. Next, those who are made partakers of the Holy Ghost. Next, those who have tasted the good word of God. Next, those who have tasted of the powers of the world to come. For those people who are like this, if they shall fall away, he says, it's impossible to renew them again to repentance. He said, listen, I know you. <laughs> See, remember, his hearers would have heard themselves in this passage because they had been enlightened. Around the second, uh, third century, they believed this enlightenment had to do with the idea of baptism. Later on, um, they thought it just about the light of Christ. Whichever one, they who were enlightened, the Bible says, he says, it is impossible, impossible 
You've heard this word many times if you're around Christian folk. This word dunamis, meaning God's dynamite. It's not really God's dynamite. What it means is it's power inherent within something. He says it is inherently impossible. There is no power for if a person, he says, uh, who was once enlightened, next, who have tasted of the heavenly gift, next, who are made partakers of the Holy Ghost, next, who have tasted the good work. You see these things? Those Christian people, enlightened, have tasted the heavenly gift. Now, I like this word gift, this word dorea. Uh, uh, it's, it's the same word that the Apostle Paul uses in Ephesians 2 when he says you're saved by grace. Not by works. It is the Dorea of God. It is the gift of God. He says, I want you to receive this heavenly gift. You are, and, and you are made partakers. And I like the fact he's talking about something the Holy Ghost has to do to you, not something they did themselves. They were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God here, the Kalas Rema. Uh, the, 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 the very utterance of God. They have tasted of that very utterance of God. And they have tasted of the world to come. He says, it is impossible to renew them to repentance. So we ought to be careful. We ought to be careful playing around with repentance. He says, because if you start responding to your Situation, whether it's this COVID 19, or whether it's being locked up in the house, or whether it's some ongoing marital problems or relational problems, whether it's whatever it is, whatever this big thing is, whatever this big bugaboo is that you just can't seem to get for, and you get to the point where you say, No, I'm going to reject Christ because I need a better way. The Bible says it is impossible to renew them. To renew them. This idea of renew. I want to read this, this word from my notes to you. This word renew them. Uh, it, it's, it's a word which, which means to, to, to bring them back. To restore to their former state. If they fall away. If they uh, be theological word apostatize. If, if they decide to, to leave Christ for something else. If they fall away, he said, it is impossible to, to, to bring them back to their former selves, to bring them back to the place of repentance where they, he said it is impossible. Now, I want to tell you something about this idea of falling away. Falling away is not a just shrug. You know, we, we will say when a person is shrugging, they're falling away. No, that, that's not falling away. Struggling means you shrug. You have this, this inner turmoil with yourself. You just don't know what to do. Or you're falling back into bad habits. That's not what falling away is. Falling away is not backsliding. You know, you used to be going to, going to the party all the time, <laughs> shake your roof thing. I'm old in the mud. <laughs> what y'all say, dropping like it's hot? No, no, I'm still old. <laughs> You're going back to your old pole dance ways. <laughs> Whatever it is that, that you used to do back in the day uh, when you were, uh, you, you know, you're, you're back in your sinful days, running away, running, whatever you running drunk, whatever you used to do, you can backslide and still be a Christian. That just means you caught up in some of the stuff you used to do. This idea of falling away, it's not just a lack of faith. This is not just a person saying, you know, I'm really struggling to believe some things about God. Because the fact is, all of us are going to have struggles with our faith. That's not what this talk. Because if it was, nobody would go there. Mm -hmm. This idea of falling away, in my study, is the idea of making a conscious decision to leave God because things aren't going um, in the way you think they should and seek another remedy. To decide this Christianity thing is Jesus thing ain't for me. You know, if, if there was really God, why, why would he allow this COVID-19 to come along and take my grandma or take my, my son or take my cousin or, or, take, or take this good person or that other person? If there was really God, so I'm going to reject God. Be careful. Be careful because you may be in the process of falling away. You may get to the point where you can't come back. I, I 
I've seen some folk go fall away. Folks who used to be strong in the faith, who decided because of whatever reason, they no longer want God. And now all they do is say things against God. The Bible says, just listen, listen. The warning here, the preacher's warning with tears. I bet I can see him preaching in his eyes saying, listen, y'all. You're going to slip back into something you can't come back from. Be careful. Because you've been enlightened. You, you have tasted the heavenly gift. You have been made partakers of the Holy Ghost. You, you, you have tasted the good rhema of God, the cow's rhema of God, the, this good word. You, you have, 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 have tasted the powers of the world to come. Don't start seeking something else because there is nothing else. There's nothing else that can compare. You've already been given the best, and I'm trying to take you to this now candidate level, but I gotta tell you, right now I'm scared that not only will you not get to this level, but you're gonna fall away from the level you're on and not be able to get back. So the Bible says, it's impossible to renew them again unto repentance. Here's why he gives his reason. Seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh. Or they re crucified the Son of God. Meaning, they decided, just like the Jews did then, and just like the Roman Gentiles did then, they decided that the only thing I can do with Jesus is kill him out of my life. So they crucified, they re crucified the Son of God. And the Bible says, put him to an open shade. Have you noticed? Our folks who have fallen away from God can't stop saying bad stuff about God. And you wonder why. Well, if you're gone, be gone. Divorce folk <laughs> that's happy they're gone, they don't spend time talking at all about the old spouse. They're glad to see him go and they're sorry they say so long. They don't want them to be any part of their lives. But it's different with God. Because sometimes you see something and then you reject God. And then in your anger, now you bring him to an open shame. You openly shame him. As a matter of fact, you're starting to think you deep. Because you can you woke now. You woke so you can say certain things with impunity because you no longer have the fear of God. Be careful. Be careful. Because the fact is, one day every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess, Philippians 2, that Jesus Christ is Lord. One day, we will all stand before the justice seat of Christ. And so, here when the preacher Pence talking about hope, he says, listen, what I've got to do is I have to set you in a place where you can have some hope. He says, because you put it to an open shame. That's the instructions to those who are going so far that they want to fall away. Maybe even go back into uh, under Moses or back into angel worship. And he says, you, you have to re crucify Jesus to get out of this. Then he gives an illustration. From his instruction, he gives an illustration. He goes from the instructor to the illustrator. He goes from the warning to a word picture. <coughs> he says, for the earth, which drinketh in the rain that comes on it, and bringeth forth herbs, meat for them by whom it is dressed, receive a blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars, he says, is rejected, and is nigh or close to being cursed, whose end or whose ultimate uh, 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 a destiny is to be burned. Notice he says in illustrating this, here's why. We are an agricultural office, so we don't really understand this kind of language often. But the idea is this, is that agricultural folks understand about good and dirt and bad dirt. He says, now, the earth or the earth, the land, which drinketh in the rain that comes on, that's God's grace. The earth doesn't create its own rain. God gives the earth the rain. And, and, and it drinks this rain in. He says now, the one that's good earth will bring forth herbs, tinny, to make the farmer happy. And therefore, 
the farmer will eulogize the ground or speak well of it. This is some good earth. I put, I, I watered it, and it's bringing up fruit because grace and provision uh, bring about expected production. See, when God pours his grace, there's an expectation that something will be produced in your life and what is produced under the ground will produce fruit on the surface. Secondly, he says, but in opposition to that, earth that receives this water but bears thorns and vessels is rejected. Same earth. Receive the water. Receive the rain. But instead of bringing forth a good crop, it brings forth weeds and sicker bushes like we used to say back in the day. You come out thinking you're going to get corn or broccoli or, or Brussels sprouts or, or some good old collard greens or, or, or some nasty root of things, or, or whatever you're cropping, you, you're expecting to go out there and, and, and it produces this thing. Instead, you go out and your whole farm is full of weeds, thorns, and thistles after you work on this ground to, to prepare it because you had an expectation. You put a seed in, you, you've watered it, in, and your expectation was that when you go out there, it was going to be corn or it was going to be broccoli. But instead of corn and broccoli coming up, what comes up is thorns, the Bible says, and thistles. Stuff you can't use. And so the Bible says what the farmer does then is he rejects that land. The first land he receives, the second one he rejects, and he curses that land. I don't curse, but y'all that are curses. <laughs> right now, you know what kind of words he's saying. He's worked the whole season expecting good stuff to come up. And he walks out there and there's nothing but weed. And he says, it's, but, 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 but. He says, it's to be cursed. And then the Bible says, what, it, what happens is now you got to burn it. Because there's something in there's something in the dirt that prevents it from doing what it's supposed to do. And so now, instead of him being able to use it, he's got to burn it before it can be used. He burns this. And, and farmers know this. If you ride up the California coast sometimes, you'll see acres and acres of land that are burned. Not by, not by wildfires, but by farmers who are burning the land so that the nutrients can renew. Because right now in its present state, oh God, it can't, it's good for nothing. And so what the farmer does, he burns. That's his illustration. He's telling us now that's how the person who falls away is. He says, those of us who are children of God who have been saved by grace, the only reason you're saved and the only reason you can produce is because God reigns on you. God puts the seed in you. God kills the land. But God expects once he does all that, that what he's worked in you, he will be worked out of you. That the grace he's put in you will not come out of you. That what he's done for you, you will do for somebody else. He says that the problem is when a person doesn't understand that the stuff they're going through, even COVID-19, is just killing the land. It's just making them better. Instead of them producing like they should, they're producing weeds. Unprofitable crops. So God said they're good for nothing. They took for nothing but to be cursed and, and burned. The point of this matter is, is that forward is the only option. That going backwards is the same as falling away. That's his point. Now, now all the theological ramifications, listen, I've been jumping through those, those hoops all week. I know what I believe about this passage. I'm going to tell you just a second. But regardless of what you believe, let me tell you some things you can know. You can know that God sent his son into the world to save himself. First Timothy 1 15. You can know that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to you. Right. You can know that. Yeah. You can know that uh, uh, he that believes in the son of God and is baptized shall be saved. Mark 16 16. You can know that. Yes. Now listen, that's, that's some hoops you can jump through now. But once saved, always I don't believe that. But, but once saved, all, all these hoops you can jump through, these these theological hoops you can jump through. Let us not be caught up in stuff that has been debated for thousands of years. Instead, let us look at what we know. We know that God loved you so much 
that he gave his son for you. And what that means is that God has invested so much in you that God is not about to allow his investment to go sour. So he's going to do everything. You cost the blood of his son. He's going to do everything to make sure that the reason he invested in you will happen. I think about the NBA a lot of times. It's often we don't understand the NBA. You know, a player maybe like Kobe Bryant or, or Michael Jordan or, or Steph Curry or, or LeBron James. And, and you're wondering why they get to get away with all the stuff they get away with. It's because the NBA has an investment. They're not about to invest all this marketing money, these being plays, these millions, tens of millions of dollars. They're not about to pay all of that and allow that investment to go. No, no, no. We're going to send the scrub. We're going to blame the scrub down there on the end of the bench. We're going to fire the coach. But the person we've invested all of this in, no, no, no. When you think about your salvation, think about how much more God has spent to acquire you. The only real question is are you going to be a Kobe Bryant or a Kwame Brown? I'm not knocking for Kwame. Kwame did what Kwame was supposed to do. But Kwame became an embarrassment because he never was able to live up to the amount of investment. Is it going to be in vain? But God is putting you. You should be, you should be right now shouting, no! No, it's not in vain. And I'm going to tell you today, God will see you. He sees in you a person whom his investment was, investment was not in vain. It was not in vain for him to open the vaults of heaven. The power of blessing to bring you home to him. It was not in vain for him to divest himself of his glory and put on the farm of sinful flesh. It was not in vain for him to be born in a manger near nasty goats and cows instead of in the finest labor and delivery room in all of Bethlehem. It was not in vain for him to be accused of being the devil when he was the son of God. It was not in vain that for him to be tried as a criminal Though he never broke the law, it was not in vain for him to be called a sinner when he never sinned and neither was deceit found in his mouth. It was not in vain for him to be betrayed by a kiss by Judas, deserted by the apostles, denied three times by Peter, sentenced to death by Pilate, crucified on an old right cross, mocked by a crowd of people that just days before he had been healing and liberating and teaching, stabbed in the side by a Roman soldier, buried in a Roman tomb. It was not in vain for him to rise early on Sunday morning, proclaiming all power in heaven and in earth uh, has been given unto me. It was not in vain for him to come visit you in the lowest point of your life when you were good for nothing, not good for yourself, and not good for anybody else, and love you when you are unloved, and, 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 and be attracted to you when you are unattractive and to call on you when you are uncalled. It was not in vain for him to pour his Holy Spirit into you when you obey the gospel of Jesus Christ by going down in the watery grave of baptism. It is not in vain for God to do what he needs to do to bring you close to him. The only time it can be vain is if we reject it and decide no! No! I don't want what you're giving me. And God is willing to say, all right. That's what you want. That's what you can have. But I'll tell you this, beloved. It's going to be hard for you to run away from God. Because God, and I need to see it, God is going to run after you when you run. They say, no, no, God ain't going after you. Oh, yes, he is. Remember the story of Hosea? Well, God had told him to marry a prostitute. And God said, go get her off the corner. Now, she can decide not to come back, but God is never going to give up on you. The only question is, will you give up hope in God? God is going to hold you. And don't let anybody tell you different. Don't let anybody tell you you or, or you've been so bad and, and glory to God don't even tell yourself believe in your heart that God the amazing God 
us, sir, if he sent Jesus to pay for me, he's going to get the same, if not more, effort to keep me. Isn't that Romans 5? He says, if while we were sinners, he sent his son. And if while we were without strength, he saved us. And if while we were enemies, he died for us. He says, how much more will he now? See, that's my hope. My hope is that even if this COVID-19 gets the best of me, that God is still going to hold me when I can't hold myself. So I'm not going to give up on God. I'm not going to give out on God. And I'm not going to give in to sin. You have an awesome day. And God bless you.